Good morning, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord. I just had to, I just had to switch off, you know, silence my phone. Not that it rains during the service, but you know. It's been raining a lot, right? In fact, I think it rained the whole night, didn't it? But some of us may uh, feel a bit but I mean uh, troubled by that, yeah. But I see it as uh, I see it as a, like a, a sign to what we've been praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The lettering that God pours and pours His Spirit upon all of us, upon His church, upon our land, upon the nation. Hallelujah. Why don't you just give one another a uh, shake your neighbor's hand and say to them, I'm glad you're here. Bless. You are blessed to be here. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Father, we just ask you to speak through your word and use, use me as a mouthpiece. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. My title for today's sermon is The Unseen Enemy. Not that I want to magnify the enemy, but now I just want to bring any context, right? Where we are. And um, Elder Thomas has been talking about <laughs> spiritual battles as well. So, to start off, what is the problem that we're facing today? One of the problems. Yeah. I'd like to say that there is an enemy who is in our blind spot. Well, what do I mean by blind spot? Yeah. If you've been wondering, what's that? If you have a car, how many of you have a car? One, two, three. What about the rest? We all walked in. Where is the Lord? Oh, Graham. Yeah. Well, that, that counts too, right? So when you're in a car, especially if you're in the driver's seat, well, what, what's the first thing that you do? If it's been driven by someone else, what's the first thing that you do? You adjust the mirror. Yeah, you adjust your seat, right? And why do you adjust the mirror? So that you can see better? Yes, okay, speak I'm sure some of you may be aware. Um, you've got a rear view mirror in front of you, well, slightly above you, in the middle. And you've got two side mirrors, right? And um, some of you probably know this. You are to adjust your rear view mirror and your side mirrors so that you can have a full view of what's behind you, right? So that there is no blind spot. There's no area where you can't see what's behind you, you know? Um, well, if that's new to you, um, that's what you should do with your mirror so that there is no blind spot, right? Now, if the mirrors are not adjusted properly, you're going to have a blind spot where you can't see um, certain vehicles, right? they might be beside you, they might, might be behind you, but you have a blind spot, right? Now, if you don't know that they exist there behind you or near you, you don't know how to react accordingly, do you? You might be making a, a lane change without knowing that there's a, a car right next to you, and you could have a collision then, right? Or especially for motorbikes these days, they seem to be always in a rush. And you don't see them, um, they're gonna hit your car, right? Okay, so that's a blind spot. The next thing I want to talk about is I mentioned the hidden enemy. Some of you may be wondering, but I'm such a nice person, you know, I, I don't have any enemies. Um, I get along with everybody, yeah. So how did how did we have an enemy, if you ask? Well, some of us probably know this. 
but some of us may not. But there is an ongoing conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan over this physical world. How many of you know this already? Only one. Two of you. Three of you. Praise the Lord. The rest of you? You're just lazy to raise your hand. And you heard of this, that the kingdom of God is invading this world. How many of you heard of this phrase? Heaven invading earth. You heard of that? Yeah. The kingdom of God invading this world. Yeah. Our physical world. And um, we know that the kingdom of Satan has control in this world. I'll, I'll explain later, right? Um, if you don't think so, you can protest. But Jesus already finished on the cross, you know? Yeah. Why is he still in control of this world? You know, in um, one of the mention, the first mention of the kingdom of God is when Jesus said, But if I cast out the demons, sorry, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Yeah. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. What does that mean? The kingdom of God has come upon you. It means that it has manifest, manifested. The kingdom of God has manifested. And the manifestation is seen in the casting out of the demons. Now, before we go on further, uh, a definition about kingdom, the word kingdom, it means the king's domain, right? The, the, the place where the king has dominion, right? So when we say the kingdom of God, yeah, we are talking about the domain where God has dominion, right? And when we say the kingdom of Satan, it is the domain where Satan has dominion. I'd like to talk a little bit about the manifestation as I talked about, as I mentioned earlier. You may be wondering manifestation, what is that? Yeah. Um, let's look at some of the manifestation of the kingdom of God. Yeah. The story of Elisha. The king of Syria was frustrated that his war plans against Israel was always known ahead of time by the king of Israel. The king of Syria finally found out that it was Elisha, the prophet, who had been revealing his plans to the king of Israel. It was told to the king of Syria that Elisha was in the city of Dothan. And so the king sent a great army to surround the city. When Elisha's servant saw that the city was surrounded, he cried out to his master in distress. So Elisha answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses. You have a great army surrounding the city. And surrounding them around the mountains, there are great horses, right? Number of horses and chariots of fire, yeah. So numerous, these are the spiritual entities. This is the manifestation of the kingdom of God. Another story, um, this is not from the text, but it's just testimonies and stories. There was a family, I've mentioned this before, some of you may know, but uh, I'd like to say it again. That was a family coming back from a worship conference. They were in their car worshiping the Lord as they were driving home. And as they, was, as they were approaching a junction, suddenly a pickup truck rushed 
trying to beat the red light. I went straight at them. And what happened was, just as the pickup truck hit them, it went through. It passed through as though the family's car was transparent. And you can see, as their faces met, you know, the family's in the car, and this car went right through, and you can see the face of the driver, and he was like, he was shocked, right? And the pickup truck went through, and I think the shock driver just drove, kept on driving. The family was saved. Now that is a bad manifestation of kingdom of God. I heard about a believer in Africa. I can't remember whether he was a minister, but definitely a believer. And he wanted to go to London and he had no money. And somehow the Lord led him to go to the airport, his local airport, into the toilet, the, the gents, the men's room, into a cubicle and asked him, lift up his hands and worship. I think that felt kind of silly because he was thinking, what will the person be the next stall think of me, right? Anyway, he obeyed, he worshipped. And then he got up from the cubicle and exit the restroom. Next thing you know, he was in the room. That's a manifestation of the of God. Committee agrees. I heard this once in a grammar class. There was a lady, a young lady, I think she was in college or something, or or maybe a friend of the instructor. She said she was with a group of friends and they were coming back from an event that night. And um, they wanted to walk her home, but she chose to depart from them and take a shortcut um, towards uh, the place that she was staying. And she went through an alley. And um, two men accosted her. They dragged her into a public toilet. But before they could lay hands on her, they saw suddenly two huge men behind her. At least uh, the attackers were so scared, they ran off. They ran off in fear because of the two men that suddenly appeared behind. And uh, she was sick. Yeah. So that's another manifestation of the kingdom of God. Now, what about the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of darkness? Yeah. Well, some of the manifestations, I do not want to magnify Satan and his kingdom. Yeah. But there are some things that you may try. For example, the pickup truck that was heading towards the family. I'm sure Satan was to destroy them. Jesus said he cast out demons. Those demons are the manifestation of the kingdom of darkness, oppressing the people. The attackers, though it was a fault, I mean you could say for the girl who chose to take the shortcut, yes, it was a silly thing. Um, in fact, foolish. But God's grace is good. Amen. Yeah. And I'm sure those attackers were sent towards her. Yeah. Now, you might be wondering why am I telling you about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness? Yeah. Well, I mentioned earlier that we have an enemy that we are wondering why do I have an enemy, right? Because the kingdom of God is being advanced through us. I said it again, the kingdom of God is being advanced through us.
God can't do it legally himself because Satan still has control, has dominion in this, in this world. Yeah. And you say, wait a minute, I thought Jesus died on the cross and he was defeated and all that, right? The Bible does say that he is the God of this world. I'm second Corinthians 4, 4, right? And now how did he get dominion? If you remember the story of Genesis, God originally gave Adam dominion over the earth, over fish in the sea, birds of the air, birds in the field. The whole realm was under Adam's control. Yeah. But what happened? Satan came along, lied to him, and Adam believed Satan, committed high treason, and basically delivered the dominion of, over the earth to Satan. And that's how he came to have the dominion of the world. Right? And um, his dominion will not end until Jesus comes back. It's the second coming of Jesus where he physically reigns on the earth. Yeah. I'm just wondering how they get here. <laughs> yeah. Um, So, however, as I said earlier, that we are the ones that the kingdom of God advance through us, right? So Jesus has equipped us, amen, right? We are not defeated, we are not struggling against the kingdom of darkness. We have authority, right? So Jesus, I will say that Jesus is our model in advancing the kingdom of God. He is the prototype, he is the model, he is the first one that did it. He came, he delivered uh, people from sicknesses and disease, he set the oppressed free, he restored the downtrodden. He did all those things, right? So he's our model in advancing the kingdom of God. But you may say, oh, that's Jesus. Some people, you know, that's Jesus, right? But notice what Jesus said in, in the verse that he uh, quoted earlier, Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. That he did it by the power of the Spirit of God. Yeah. He, be he became fully man, though he was fully God, but he, he didn't use his privilege as God. He became fully man under the power of the Holy Spirit and he did he advance the kingdom of God. And he is a model for us and that was, that's what we have to do as well. So he has given us the same spirit as to do what he did. Everybody say that. I have the spirit of God in you. I have the, I have the same spirit that Jesus had. I have the same power that Jesus had. Amen. And notice this. He taught us the Lord's Prayer. He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. He tells us to pray that prayer. It means we are the one to bring in his kingdom and let it invade the earth. We are the channels. Amen. And he also said this before he departed, right? There's no excuse for us. He said, <laughs> And we even have it behind the curtain in our, our mission statement, right? He said that we will do greater things than what he did. Yeah. So, because of all this, we have an enemy. Because we are invading his turf. Is turf, sorry, yeah. Right? The world is under the control, the dominion of Satan. Right? But we are advancing the kingdom of God. We are taking territories. When you do that, somebody's not going to be happy, right? 
you think everybody will be happy? Somebody is not going to be very happy, right? So Satan is out to stop us. Yeah. He's no stranger to using dirty tactics. You will use any tactics. Yeah. I'm not saying to magnify him. I'm just saying that he doesn't play fair. And that's why Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13 tells us, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. It's almost like preparing us. That all of us somehow will go through a day when it's going to be difficult. But we are to put on the armor of God. To stand. And notice that it's only an evil day, it's not days. Yeah. We have many good days, but we are prepared for the evil day. Yeah. So, what must we do? Besides um, <clears throat> the armor of God, right? Should we be ignorant of the enemy and just believe that God is the author of good and bad as suggested by the case of Job? Uh, Job? Should we just be ignorant and fight? Don't worry about all these things. I just want to live my life. Learn the nice of Christian You know, work from 8 to 5 and then I go for my polling, I go for my, my shows and uh, whatever, whatever you think the hobbies that you have. Right? Live, live your nice Christian life. Well, let's look at Job. Yeah. It seems that people in the Old Testament weren't very or not aware at all about the devil and the kingdom of darkness. Do you find that as you read the Old Testament? The devil is not very much mentioned, right? Or at least um, it's not as clear. Job was certainly one of them who wasn't aware that the devil was behind the sudden calamities that came upon him and his family. Job had a blind spot, in other words. Yeah. He had no knowledge, no one could react to the unseen enemy. Right. Let's look further. He didn't know that Satan was the god of this world. No. And that Satan had watched all his actions and knew his greatest fear. What was Job's greatest fear? That God would take away everything he possessed. That's his greatest fear. Now, the very thing that Job believed that could trigger this, that God would take away everything that he has, was the act of cursing God. And you can see this, huh? that he will sanctify his children. Right? He would offer um, burnt offerings for them after their party days. Wow, people in those days also get party, right? Um, the sons, the, the seven sons and the three daughters, they get together in, in, in I suppose, from houses to house. They had a great time. Right? And Job will worry about them in case they curse God in their heart while they were parking away. And he would offer burnt offerings for them, right? And you see how worried he is about this thing about cursing God. However, Satan had accused Job of only being pious, right? Because he was blessed and his possession had increased. That's what Satan accused Job of before God, right? In fact, Job's possessions has been, had increased tremendously in the land. Okay. Tremendously. Great. Satan knew of Job's fear and his aim was to get Job to curse God. And how does he do that? By taking away everything that Job, that Job had. Okay. So Satan asked God for the chance to sift Job. 
Just like how he asked for Peter to be sifted. To sift him by wheat. Here's the thing. Job had no one to be deceived on. And so Satan was given the right to do what Job feared. And, and listen to this, listen to what happened. Almost within the same day, Job lost 1,000 oxen and 500 donkeys to Sabian raiders. As well as the servants taking care of them. Yeah. I don't know the value of that in our modern day, but that's a lot. And then the fire came from the sky and consumed the 7,000 sheep and the servants taking care of them. Now, if you saw fire coming from heaven and wipe out, a huge flock of sheep. What do you think? Do you think that is normal? You would think, oh God is punishing me, good sheep. And this was followed almost immediately by the loss of 3,000 camels to the banks of the Indians who also killed the servants taking care of them. How crazy is this? All within almost the same time. You think it's normal? And then the house, he had seven sons, right? Three dollars. And then the house where they were in suddenly collapsed. And all the children died. Killing all of them. Now, notice he has lost his wealth. He has lost his children. And you would think that it can't get worse, right? And then a short while later, he was stricken with painful walls all over his body, at the top of his head, to the sole of his feet. So he lost his wealth. He lost his his family, and he lost his health. All within a short time. And you think that your problem is bad. Yeah. And we think our problem is bad. And so um, his wife, seeing all this destruction, yeah, seeing that they lost their wealth, Seeing that the family is gone, the children are gone. And finally, what broke the camel's back is seeing him, his health. The wife was so angry at God. He didn't say directly in the passage, but she was so angry at God, she basically told him, Why don't you just curse God and die? That's the very thing that you refuse to do. Since all these things have happened, why don't you just curse God and get it over with? And this was the very thing that Job was careful not to do his whole life, not to curse God. Yeah. But from the wife's perspective, it's good for nothing now. You lost everything. Yeah. You might as well curse God. Now, here's the thing. Although Job never cursed God, as we see, yeah. But he did think that God was behind all of this. He didn't know that the unseen enemy was, was uh, doing all these things, right? Was the master uh, mind behind all these things. And so was the one who carried out all the calamities against him. So his blind spot led him to the conclusion. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord.
Can we accept this? It's a Bible verse, isn't it? Can we? There are so many Christians who believe this that the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Why can't we accept this? Because if we accept this, we won't be able to fight against the real enemy. And if we think God is behind the good and the bad, we will know who is the enemy, right? You will see that God is behind what you need to fight. He's, he's the boss, right? He's the originator of the good. He's also the originator of your problem currently. Why, why do you need to fight, right? And definitely you will not ask him to help to overcome this problem. If you think that God is the one giving you that problem, you will probably think, yeah, he's doing it to me to make me a better person. Another thing is, if we believe that, we can't trust God and keep ourselves holy to Him. If you believe that God is unpredictable, and that He is, you know, sometimes He's good, so good to you, and sometimes He's so bad to you, you won't be able to trust Him. You won't be able um, to come near Him. We will constantly be in fear and not secure. Yeah. If God will use calamities, bankruptcies, the killing of the loved ones, uh, even the killing of our pets. Some of us love our pets more than our children. Yeah. Yeah. And putting diseases upon us to test our loyalty to Him. We will be like walking on eggshells around God. It will be just like two. Do you think Job had an intimate relationship with the Lord? Another thing is, we are told to bring the good news to the world. What good news is there to tell if we have no hope? Yeah, if, if our God is unpredictable, we're telling them, you gotta believe in Jesus so that good things will happen to you. And bad things too. Moving on, I want you to see how Jesus dealt with the unseen enemy. First of all, Jesus revealed the truth about God the Father. Because all these while it seemed that God is such a tyrant. But Jesus revealed the truth about God the Father. Because the devil was hidden for much of the Old Testament, yeah, he wasn't. Um, very clear in the Old Testament. God was the one who took the wrath yeah, for the good and the bad that happened to the world. And you still see it today that people are saying, oh God, if God is good, why is all these bad things happening? Right? No, they seldom mention, oh, the devil is doing this in the world. Do you? I have almost never seen in the media, especially in the mainstream, that the devil is mentioned as the also, bad things in the world. Yeah? He's always God. Yeah? But Jesus, Jesus has shown God the Father to be otherwise. How? He says, as you, as you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Meaning, I am a reflection of the Father. I am the mirror. Whatever you see in me, whatever you see me do, that's the fun. That's the fun. You notice that no way in the four gospel do you see Jesus rejecting someone who come to him for help? No? Get away from him, yeah? Not forgiving them? Not healing them? 
No way in the floor comes forth. You see Jesus causing bad things to happen to someone to teach them a lesson. Then the woman who was a prostitute, they were about to stone her. Did Jesus throw a stone as well? Instead, Jesus only did what he saw the Father was doing. Yeah. And so we see that the Father's heart of compassion being reflected in Jesus, the Son. As you have seen the Father, you have seen. Sorry, but you see me, you have seen the Father. The second thing that he did when he came was that he revealed that the real destroyer, the real enemy, is the devil. It's as though he lift up the curtain and show the world. This is the one that's been causing your problem. Now not much was revealed about the devil before Jesus came. There were scriptures in the book of Genesis, Job, Isaiah, and even Ezekiel that make references to Satan, but they did not fully reveal the being that Jesus exposed in the New Testament. With the benefit of hindsight from the New Testament, we could understand that these verses in the Old Testament refer to the devil. But they were cryptic enough not to reveal much information about him. They show the existence of a spirit realm of good and evil spirits, but doesn't reveal much about a war between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God. Yeah. <coughs> however, when, however, Jesus says in John ten ten, this is this is the um, this is the exposure. <coughs> the thief, the thief, does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. John ten ten. Jesus addressed Satan. Jesus addressed the devil directly. And showed the works of the devil. He exposed Satan as the hidden enemy, the unseen enemy. Not, not God. During his ministry on the earth, Jesus destroyed the works of the devil. Amen. We saw him going, going around. Yeah. He went about healing all diseases and sickness, setting the captives free. He destroyed what Satan was doing. <coughs> so truly, God the Father, through Jesus, came to give life. Or the devil destroys and take away lives. Yeah, the enemy now is exposed. He has been hiding behind the fact that God is the originator of good and evil. And now he is exposed for who he is. I'm so blessed by the song that uh, Sister Priscilla sang about the blood. The third thing that Jesus um, did was, one well, of the many things that Jesus did, I'm just listing three things, right? The third thing that Jesus did was, He shed blood, He shed His blood, right? which is our defense and our means to overcome the enemy. What do I mean by this? When Jesus went to the cross and was crucified on our behalf, the blood speaks in our defense. The blood speaks. You know, when Abel died, killed by Cain, his blood cried out to God. Right? From the ground, it cried out to God. It cried out for vengeance. It has a voice. The blood of Jesus has a voice. It cries for us. It cries on our behalf. It speaks to God on our behalf. Hallelujah.
And what does the blood speak of? There are many things, but I'd just like to list three of them. It cries that we have been, we have forgiveness of sin. Amen. Colossians 1, verse 13 to 14. It cries out that we are righteous and not guilty of all the accusations against us before God that Satan brings before God. In Colossians 1, verse 20, it says, the blood reconciled us to God. Reconciled. There was a separation, but He has, he has reconciled us to the Father. Amen. We are no longer separated from God. We are able to enjoy the benefits. Yeah. The benefits of His presence and the promises. And so, how should we live now? How should we live now through faith in, in what Jesus did? Yeah? Two things. The first one, renew our perception of God. He is not the author of good and evil. Amen. We need to renew that perception. Unlike what Job, uh, the conclusion that Job came to, God is not the author of good and evil. Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 9, He says, He who has seen me has seen the Father. We talked about that earlier. Let's ask ourselves Has Jesus ever said, You are lame? Here, have some blindness to go with it. <coughs> As Jesus ever said, don't come near me, you have leprosy. Instead, he healed, he laid hands on the lepers. You know, for, for Jewish uh, law, a leper is not to come, is never to come in public, in contact with uh, people especially to Jewish people, because they contaminate right? They become unclean if they, they come near. Um, the, the person who is clean becomes unclean when he, touch, when he touches or he is near a leper. And Jesus, showing that the kingdom of God is greater, laid hand on the leper who came to him and said, I am willing. And the leper was cleansed, was healed. Hallelujah. <coughs> and Jesus forgave, we saw, he restored, he had compassion on the unsafe that he saw as sheep. He saw the multitudes, he saw the people of the world as sheep without a shepherd. And that's the Father. Hallelujah. And he says, this is what my father is like, just like me. You want to have a better picture of God? Jesus is your picture. Think about Jesus. That's how you know what the father is like. You know, Psalms 91 verse 14 to 16. Describe what God is really like. Wait, I need to know him. I'll read it to you. It says in verse 14, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him. And show him my salvation. James chapter 1 verse 17 reinforces this. It says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. 
with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. It means he doesn't change. He is constant. He is good. And how is he good? Because every good gift and every perfect gift comes from him. He doesn't give you bad gifts. He doesn't give you a serpent. He gives you us. I can't remember what, what was the, the, the verse, but you ask him something good, he doesn't give you something harmful. And Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22 reminds us the blessing of the Lord makes one rich. Everybody say that. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich. And he has no sorrow with it. He doesn't give you a good thing and then give you another bad thing to balance it out. It's not like people have to think it's balance out, you know, balance yourself. No. Second thing of how we are to live our life through faith in Jesus. Yeah. Second thing is to be aware of the war between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Sometimes we lose focus on that, don't we? Sometimes it turns into like, oh, it's all about bless me, bless me, bless me. And more and more blessings, right? There's nothing wrong with being blessed. In fact, we need to be blessed. We need to experience this love. It's so important for us to have intimacy with the Father. But there's a bigger picture. There is a bigger picture, I see. And you have a role in it. You are not just in your own nice home, your nice office, your nice car. There is a bigger picture involving you and me and everybody in this place and all the believers in the world. You have heard the saying, we are in this world, but not of this world. Have you? Anybody? Yeah. No? Yeah. Why do we say that? Sounds like... Um, what's the word for it? A paradox? <laughs> You're in here, but you're not of this place? Why? Because we belong to the kingdom of God. Amen. We don't conform to the pattern of this world. And the kingdom of God is warring against the kingdom of darkness that has control in this realm, yeah, in this physical world. Now, even though we live in this world, we are not normal citizens of the world because we have a mandate to manifest the kingdom of God. I say that again, we have a mandate to manifest the kingdom of God. Amen. 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 Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 tells us this. Yeah? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, Against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Anybody ever done? Anybody ever done wrestling? Wrestling in the Anybody? I think it involves some effort. It's not instantaneous that you, your enemy, and you don't say to the enemy, I mean, roll over, ah, finish. Right? There is a wrestling going on, isn't it? Yeah. One thing I want to point out is this, like what Elder Edward mentioned earlier. 
we heaven are fair and are rich in this struggle, in this wrestling with the kingdom. We have an, an unfair advantage, I say. Amen. Because we have authority over the kingdom of us. Amen. The visions of the 1, verse 22 to 23 tells us, And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. All things. That includes all principality, power, might, dominion, <coughs> even the devil himself. Okay. We are seated with him in the heavenly places. We are his body. The body, and he said, it, the Father has put everything under his feet. If you are the body, the feet belongs to the body, right? So the body is above all these principalities, the, the, the kingdom of darkness. Yeah. So we are not wrestling for victory. We are enforcing the victory that Jesus won for us. Hallelujah. We are expanding, expanding the kingdom of God, God's domain on the earth. We are claiming territory. You know the saying, heaven invades the earth. It is through us. Sometimes you make it think as though heaven invades the earth. Ah, okay, it's over there. But actually, we are the channels. It is through our prayers. Okay? We sang the song, kneeling. Through our declarations, our powerful declarations. We pray for our country, continue to declare that the righteous will rule. In this life. Amen. Amen. Through our acts, our acts of compassion, through our sharing of the gospel, the gifts of the Spirit operating through us. This is how heaven invades the earth. And lastly, um, Something to add to the second point. Revelation 12, verse 11 tells us to overcome the accuser of the brethren by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. You know that the devil watches us like lion, watches the grave. Yeah? Not to make you feel afraid or anything, just to tell us that he is not on vacation somewhere. He's watching us, right? Not that we should be afraid, but we should know that he's watching, right? He's gaining ammunition against us now. So that he can accuse us. And what he wants to do is to cause us to focus on our flesh, to focus on the failures of our flesh. He fires the fiery darts at us to keep us focused on ourselves, on our failures. Yeah. He brings all those thoughts. Job had no one to speak on his behalf when Satan was accusing him before God. Okay. But we are to overcome the accusations of the devil by focusing on the blood of Jesus that speaks in our defense. Amen. Confess out. Homologio. Speak the same what the blood is already saying on our behalf. Yeah, by the word of our testimony, saying that we have the forgiveness of sins through the blood. We are not guilty before God because of the blood. We are no longer separated from God because of the blood. God is on our side because of the blood. 